Hello and welcome to Bealton Baptist Church today. We're so happy to have you joining us. If you are joining us for the first time, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much. I would encourage you to visit our website at bealtonbc.org to find out some more information about us. Also, if you have a prayer request today or a praise you'd like to share, we would love to pray for whatever's on your heart. You can email that to the church office at bealtonbc at comcast.net. All right, I have two announcements. We are excited this year we can have a yard sale. Yay. So everybody bring whatever you have from home um, that you wanna get rid of. You might wanna check with family members, but anyway, you're gonna bring it the first week in October. We'll start collecting it in here on a Monday night, um, that first Monday in October. And then um, we're gonna have truck or treat. And this year we're gonna do it on a Saturday from 5.30 to 7, so same time frame. But we're excited to see, we're going to do a big competition, Rebecca said, on biblical themed trunks. So get creative. I've already had a couple of people come talk to me and then sign up right behind this wall in the hall. So we'd love to have you do that. I hope that y'all are ready this morning. We're just going to start with worship on This Is Amazing Grace. So let's stand and let's sing together.
soul In the middle of the war You guard my soul You are Lord on the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm The solid ground is falling down from underneath my feet. Between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel the rain remind me in the eye of the storm. about some of the things that are going on in our community right now. And um, I'd like to start off about maybe thinking about that as we begin our prayer time. Uh, you know, we've been going through this COVID stuff. I promised I wasn't going to say it, but uh, I did say it, COVID, for uh, almost two years now. And um, what I'm sensing with people is people are getting really, really tired. Teachers are getting tired. Administrators are getting tired. Uh, I'll be honest, as uh, working in the church, the church gets tired too. The staff gets tired. And, um, you know, there's a lot of churches in our area that are struggling right now because people are just tired. 
And what we need to be praying for is strength, and we need to be praying for courage as we continue to walk through this. We're not going back to the way that we were, uh, but we need to determine how God wants to lead us into the future. Along with that, um, a number of people have asked us to pray for them. Um, Lucky and Linda, uh, we're going to be praying for you this morning. We continue to pray for the Boley family. Uh, Lillian, uh, we are sad to hear about the loss of your mom, and, uh, but we will continue to pray for you and your family. We're pr praying for Lori's mom. We're continuing to pray for Sandy as she recovers from her back surgery. And, of course, we continue to hold Christine up in our prayers. We've also been getting a lot of prayer requests from our community. And so I just want to hold those up a little bit and remind you that if you get your uh, e-blast during the week, um, maybe think about praying for those people as well. William and Abigail and Sandra, Michelle, Cindy, and then two-year-old two year Colton, Kimberly, Mary, Mary Jo, Julie, and Jerome, and Samaria. So... Be, be in prayer for them and continue to pray for them. Maybe spend time in the morning as you're waking up and you're getting your cup of coffee. Just say a little prayer for those people. Will you join me as we go to Lord in prayer? Heavenly Gracious Father, we know that we should begin our days and end our nights speaking to the one that we owe everything for and we owe everything to. And we ask, Lord, that you remind us even in our drowsiness and maybe in our tiredness in the evening, that if we begin and we end our um, time in prayer, our day in prayer, life will be so much better. Father, we do pray for uh, our community right now. And uh, this, uh, this whole last two years has been tough. And uh, we would be dishonorable if we didn't acknowledge that. But you have given us the ability to overcome and overcome these things. And so, Lord, as we go to come to you this morning, I ask that you give the people in our community strength. I pray for those administrators. I pray for the, the superintendent of our school who has so much pressure on him right now. I pray for the principals that we have in our local community that are doing such great things and are keeping a steady line. I pray for the teachers and the helpers that are doing things. Lord, I pray for the kids. And uh, we may discount uh, how difficult this has been on them, but it wears people down. And Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for strength. And I pray that they go to the place that truly gives them strength. Lord, I have mentioned a number of uh, different um, prayer requests that we have received here at the church, some from our church members, some from the community. And Lord, we ask that you uh, uh, acknowledge those and lift them up. Lord, help us to be reminded that the prayers of righteous men and women do do great things. And we ask that you remind us that prayers do not go unlistened to unheard, that they are listened to by you and that you act upon them in the way that you see fit. Help us to be prayer warriors, Jesus. And we ask all these things in that glorious and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A not-so-new claim is being regurgitated all across the globe these days, and it goes a little something like this. There's so much pain and suffering in the world, there can't be a good God. Well, let's dive in. But before we do, let me tell you, this is the fastest response to this claim known to man and is merely a plain, kind of logical, and no way comprehensive one hurled upon you sans emotion and utterly lacking gentility. This is debunked, after all, not de nice. Okay, we're going to break this claim down in two parts and respond in rapidly rational rhetoric, rightly rendering reason right before your very eyes. Two little duck ducks all in a row. Let's knock them down. Duck numero one. A good God wouldn't allow pain and suffering. Really, why not? 
Seriously, what if the temporal nature of pain and suffering was actually necessary to accomplish a greater eternal thing? I mean, that's how the Apostle Paul understands it. Listen to his words. But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. He continues with, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And he brings it home with this, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So Paul realizes at least from a Christian perspective, that pain, suffering, and trials are real but temporary, necessary in preparing us for something greater, and not worth even comparing to the eternal life God grants us through Christ. Now, my pal Mr. Lewis, C.S., not Jerry, wrote this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. A duck dose. If there is a God, he doesn't care about us. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow pain and suffering. Okay, here's a bit of history and context for clarity coming at you solo style in less than 12 parsecs. God creates a beautiful, good, sinless, and perfect universe for us to live and flourish in. We utterly destroy it by our own free will. Then we keep on committing horrible crimes against him and each other even though we know better. But he doesn't lop off our heads the minute we do something bad. He's patient with us and pursues us in love, steps into time and space as the God-man Jesus gives his life for ours, takes on the punishment we deserve by dying on a cross, then conquers sin and death when he resurrects from the dead, allowing anyone who repents of their sins and places their trust in him to be redeemed, restored, renewed, and live in paradise with him forever, even though we don't deserve it. Now, does that sound like a God who doesn't care? I think not. Ah, that's fine and all, you say. But I can't see a good and morally sufficient reason why this particular bad thing happened to this person, so I don't believe there's a good God. So answer me this. What percentage of all there is to know do you know? And let's say you know 0.001%, which is pretty liberal considering you and all there is to know. The God described in the Bible knows 100% of all there is to know. Somewhere in that gaping chasm between the little you know and all that God knows, you're telling me there can't be a morally sufficient or good reason why God might allow something bad to happen? You're banking on the impossible chance that you know more than God. So you're telling me there's a chance. No, Lloyd, no chance. And I end with this because I want to. In Job 38 through 41, God asked Job, a man who went through untold sufferings but started questioning God's motive and character, a series of questions. Here's my fave. Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their role on earth? Paraphrase, I create stars and planets, bro. I establish all laws out of thin air that govern the universe. And you want to question me? Well, Job gets it and says this. Behold, I am of small account. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I don't know, but maybe this should be our position when it comes to questioning God about things we have little capacity to fully understand. It might be a bit wiser to do what the psalmist says and trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Because honestly, when it comes to comparing our knowledge to God's, we don't know Jack. But we can know Jesus, the ultimate remedy for all pain and suffering and the one that will put an end to all evil. And that is that on that. This claim that there can't be a good God if there is pain and suffering, this faulty notion that God doesn't care about us, has been utterly debunked. Adios. If you have your Bibles, grab them. Uh, We're going to be going through a lot of verses this morning, so bear with us. But at the same time, we're going to be living in the book of Job. Because that's really what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about how you can have courage in calamity, and the vehicle we're going to uh, uh, use to do that is we're going to use the book of Job. Now, I don't know what your childhood has been like. I wonder if everybody has had people who have read to them. Perhaps, just perhaps, somebody has read this to you as a child. Perhaps, just perhaps, you might have read it yourself. Or, even more so, Perhaps you have seen the movie that follows this little poem about the life of a young man called Alexander. Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day follows the exploits of a young boy, Alexander, as he experiences the most terrible, horrible day of his young life. A day that began with gum stuck in your hair. Have you ever had gum stuck in your hair? Often you see people getting their gum stuck in their hair by people putting it in their hair. But in Alexander's case, what happened was he fell asleep with gum in his mouth and he got gum in his hair. And then it follows all the other calamities 
that happened to this poor young man throughout the day. Now, even though it's a children's story, I think we as adults can relate. We have all had one of those days, and you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps one of those days is actually today. Things seem to go wrong at every turn. At every bend in the road, there is something that goes wrong. And for some of us, that terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day has extended for the last two years. Now there is a story in the Old Testament about a man who not only had a bad day, he had a series of bad days that extended into weeks, months, and perhaps a year. The book of Job is one of the world's oldest and most powerfully written works of literature. Some commentators argue it predates the writing of the first five books of the Bible. The book deals with the issue of suffering and provides insights into one of the most asked questions that we as Christians come across in our lifetime. If you haven't asked this question, I would argue that probably somebody close to you has asked this question of you. And that question is, why does a loving God allow suffering? Job, this story of Job, this book of Job, is a story about a good, devout man. He's a great guy. He's a good guy. And he's a follower of God who has succeeded in everything in his life. And we feel comfortable that he succeeded because he is such a good guy. He has a big family. He has a big business. And it seems like everything is going right for him. But then Satan intervenes and insists that Job only serves God because God protects him and seeks God's permission to test Job's faith and his loyalty. God gives Satan permission. And in the course of the first two chapters, we see Job stripped of everything. To get a real good flavor of what's going on here and the dire straits that Job finds himself in, let's take a look at just the first chapter, verses 13 through 19. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, while the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone has, has escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, a lightning storm struck from heaven. It burned up the sheep and the servants and devoured them. And I alone has, have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported, the Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels, and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And then on verse 18, he was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in front in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house it collapsed on the young people so that they died i alone have escaped to tell you i don't think these verses need much explanation a terrible tragedy strikes job in one day job's family and all his assets 
are completely wiped out. In the book of class, in, excuse me, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, King Solomon is speaking, and he says, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And there is a time for suffering in all of our lives, but if I were to look at Job's situation right now, I would say that there was much weeping and much mourning in Job's life. Job's life is a quantum leap worse than the really bad day of the little boy Alexander. But yet, it is in that space, in between the little boy Alexander and the devoted man Job, that we live in this world. This is the situation we live in. In a lifetime, we go through a host of difficulties. And I don't think anybody is immune from them. Children go through suffering, or at least what they see as suffering. Teenagers go through difficult times. At least what they see are difficult times. Moms and dads go through suffering. Grandparents, they go through suffering. And for the person going through that period of suffering, it is just as real and is just as difficult as it was for Job. Now, I say this because I find that it's very easy for us to minimize the difficulties of others. The other day I was reading an opinion piece about how soft people are today. That in World War I and World War II, our parents and our grandparents had to fight a great adversary and 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 go through some difficult times, and all we complain about is wearing a mask. Now, I think there is some perspective that that comes, comes with that story. But I also think it misses the point that suffering is very personal. And that when we suffer, it can overwhelm the person who is suffering whether it is a child that is suffering over gum in their hair or a father who has lost his family and his livelihood. Both situations and all the situations that could be in between are painful. In verse 120, we see Job tearing his clothes and shaving his head in Old Testament times, this was a response of repentance, but it was also a, a response of great sorrow and an acknowledgement of suffering. Job was hurting, and well, he should be hurting. But then in verse 1, excuse me, in, in chapter 1, verse 21, he says this, Naked I, came into my mo- uh, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Now get this, praise the name of Yahweh, or of God, or of Jehovah. Job, even in his darkest time, was able to worship. And you see, That, I think, is the big difference between Alexander and Job. While Alexander's day kept getting worse and worse, mainly because Alexander saw his day getting worse and worse, Job, at the end of the day, was able to praise. Sometimes, I see that the way we respond to suffering is much more of a product of what we're, what's going on in our hearts and what's going on in our heads than what is going on in the world around us. How we respond to suffering deals much more of what's going on inside of us, the internal things, than the, really the external pressures that are going on around us. We all have suffering. But when we do, we need to make sure that our headspace 
is in the right place. Now, I'll tell you, there are a lot of what I would call myths out there. And if you're not careful, these can rule your life. And so this morning, what I would like to do is just spend a few moments talking about five of those myths that I think need to be jettisoned out of our lives. And then I'd like to end with five promises that God gave us that we can hang on to when we're suffering. The first myth, Christians do not suffer. Suffer. Deep down inside, there is a part of us which protests. But I am a Christian. I love God. He loves me. So bad things shouldn't happen to me. Because God said he protects his children. And I will let you know, God does love his children. And he does protect us from terrible things. But you see, we still live in a fallen world. And it's a messed up world sometimes. And sometimes Christians get the consequences like anybody else that goes through this world. Jesus in, 16, in John 16, 33 says, we should expect trials and difficulties in the world today. In the book of Job, Job's suffering is a product of an eternal conflict that goes on every day in this world. Christians do suffer. The second myth is this. If Christians suffer, it is because they have done something wrong or someone else has done something wrong. That's not necessarily true. In John 9, the disciples asked Jesus, why a blind man is blind? And their supposition is, Either he sinned or his parents sinned. And Jesus says, no, it's not like that at all. This man is blind to show the glory of God. And there's a whole lot of reasons that we go through suffering. Of course, there are consequences to wrongdoings. And I don't want to minimize that. And sometimes suffering can be the result of some of the things that we do, the wrong-headed things that we do. God does discipline us for things that we do wrong. But it might not totally be that. It might be something totally different. It might be that God is calling you to be a testimony. It might be that God is preparing you for a greater task. It might be that it is just a product of living in a messed up world, and God wants to pour out his mercy on you and not his judgment. Christians don't suffer for the sins of somebody else or the sins of themselves sometimes. Myth number three. If I had enough faith... This would not be happening to me. The reality is, is the Bible does say that God rewards people of faith, people with strong faith. But it's not the inverse all the time. Suffering comes even to people who have enormous faith. Job was a man of great faith and great righteousness. He was so good, God bragged on him. And yet, for things that Job and, in fact, his friends who would come to comfort him later did not have a clue about, Job was going through a period of suffering. Sometimes we go through suffering, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with how strong a faith or how weak a faith that we have. Both faithful and unfaithful people have suffering. Myth number four, what we are going through is meaningless. In the book of Ecclesiastes, so Solomon writes this. He says, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. 
And sometimes we can look at the suffering that people are going through and the suffering that is happening around us, and we sometimes see pointlessness. And it's, we, we understand that it is beyond our understanding. But C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem with Pain, asserts pain is the classroom of God. When we are going through painful things, when we are going through difficult circumstances, it is almost inevitable that we become closely knitted to God. Sometimes we learn more about the goodness of God when we are hurting rather than during the times that we're succeeding. And anybody will tell you that these lessons can be tough at the time. But later, we will value them because they came at such a cost. There's something that happens. When we learn something during a very difficult time in our lives, it sticks with us more because it came at such a great cost. Myth number five. God has abandoned me. Sometimes people feel that God has abandoned them. They may not say it, but in their hearts, they find a loneliness. God has abandoned them, has left them on their own. God never abandons his children. He is always there, always nearby, to be drawn closer, not to be pushed away. God is a God that never abandons his children. If you believe any of these myths, I would encourage you to flush them now. If you're going through a difficult time right now, I would encourage you to flush these now. If you are not going through a difficult time and everything's going rosy, I, I, would, I would suggest that you mentally make a determination that you're not going to go there with any of these myths. Because instead of these myths that seem to kind of seep into the church and to seep into the life of, of believers, God provides promises. And so this morning, as we end, I would like to provide five promises that you can hold on to during difficult times. The first promise that you can stake your life on is you are not alone. During our darkest moments, God is there. When you are at your lowest point, a place where even those closest to you cannot walk with you, it is God who walks at our side. Psalm 23.4 tells us that though we may walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil, for you, God, are with me. I have found that sometimes people have different names for these suffering times in their lives. I was listening to David Jeremiah a number of months ago, and he was talking about suffering in his life, and he was recounting a time where he had lymphoma, and he talked about this was a bend in the road for him, that it was a bend in the road in his life. Everything was going straight, and all of a sudden, lymphoma gives him a bend in the road. No one faces bend, a bend in the road alone. If we knew God before the bend, he will be beside us as we take the curve and move in the other direction. The second promise you need to hold on to. God's word will always be a com comfort for us. So how do you feel the presence of God when things are desperate and you need him so desperately and you feel deserted? You go to scripture. Scripture. Psalm 119.25 says, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. When times are tough, God has given us a tool 
that we can live in our, we can use in our lives, that can help us through those difficult times. And that tool is his word. Promise number three, God cares that we suffer. Most people naturally turn to God when trouble hits, but some are tempted to withdraw from everyone, including God. They get to a point where they just say, I don't feel like I want to talk to anyone. I don't feel, and I, I, I don't care for anyone because I know that as I get through this bend in the road, there's going to be another bend, and there's going to be another blow. And they're tempted to think that God does not care. But the thing is, is that God has already said that our suffering does matter to him. We are exceedingly precious in God's sight. You're the apple of his eye. In Zechariah 2.8, it says, He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Promise number four, God will give you the grace that you need to handle the situation that you're going through. As God permits pain in the lives of his children, he also bestows upon them an equal measure of grace that they would never experience outside of that suffering. The Apostle Paul experienced what I would characterize as disruptive times in his life. And he talks about a thorn in his side. But I think we realize that unless Paul had that thorn in his side, he would not be able to tell us about how to resolve that thorn and how to withstand the pain of that thorn. And then finally, number five. Promise number five. It's true. It really is. All things work for God according to his purpose. According to his purpose. Now I will tell you that that verse is flung around all too, too often. I think sometimes we use it as a place of comfort for people who are suffering at a point. We need to be very sensitive to that per person's suffering. We need to be very uh, sensitive and empathetic to the situation that person goes through. But sooner or later, they need to hear, as they perhaps get out on the other side of that suffering, that all of those things that they went through worked for good. That we have come through the tube. We have come through the valley. And now we're on the other side and we have matured and we find ourselves in a situation perhaps better than we were. Can I be honest with you about something? I think many times when we go through suffering, we are a lot more like little Alexander than we are Job. Little Alexander a lot of the situations that he found himself in in that little poem that we started out with, that poem that we were talking about, actually were things that were generated because he had, had a previously bad experience. And so he worked himself into a worse and worse and worse and worse day. Job, on the other hand, no matter how bad it got, rested on the promises of God and was able, when it was all said and done, after a terrible day, to worship God and trust him. And because of that trust, he could move on from that point. Nobody should ever discount the pain and suffering that Job went through. Nobody should ever discount the pain and suffering people go through today. But when we can hold on, when we can stand on the promises of God and not believe the myths that we conjure up in our mind, 
truly, we can learn to get up from those difficult times in life and stand. Will you pray with me? Lord, this feels like a timely message. It feels like there's a need to talk about courage and calamity. It feels like there's the right time to talk about suffering and how we handle suffering and how we get through suffering. Lord, help us to never look down on a little kid who is suffering because of something that we see as so small, a broken toy, a lost pet, something that means so much to them. That's suffering, Lord. Help us to be empathetic. Help us also to be empathetic to the person who is really going through those tough times in their lives, those real big things, the sicknesses, the pain, the loss. Help us to be empathetic to them. But also, Lord, help us in kindness and gentleness. Lead them on to a place of courage. Father, if there is anything that we can call Jesus, we can call him Counselor, Mighty King, the Everlasting Father. We can call him Savior, Redeemer. We can also call him courageous. Because through him, he suffered so that we would not have to suffer for eternity. And with courage, took the pain so that we didn't have to. Lord, this morning as we go out from here, as we go out into this world around us, help us to acknowledge a suffering world but allow us to move forward with courage. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.